Hello, my name is Kathy Elliott. I'm from the Ministry of Education, and I'm pleased to be the person who's moderating the webcast today on project-based learning. I have a few things to get you ready for our webcast today, uh, and I'd like to take you through some of the things. First of all, you'll find in your package, I hope you've had time to download some things, you'll find participants' agenda and notes. We'd like you to get that out and uh, make sure you have it available. We're going to be using this piece of um, graphic organizer throughout our webcast. So it'll give you a, a place to write your notes and your thinking and your, the discussions. Also, there, you'll find that you will have downloaded a handout for participants and facilitators. If you, the second page of this looks like this. I know, I think I know, and I want to know. So you'll need that with you too. And you might also have downloaded the bibliography. I'd like also to draw your attention to your computer screen. The bottom right-hand corner of your computer screen will have a little box on it that says questions. That's where you are become interactive with us. That's where you type in your questions and your thinking. Our pres presenter today, Sue Fraser, will be glad to answer your questions several times during the webcast and again at the end when we uh, take all the questions that we haven't quite had time for. And if we have more questions than we have time to answer live on this webcast, we'll definitely be answering them when we archive. So please keep your questions coming in to us. I'll be reminding you during the webcast to keep them coming in. We're a little bit fussy about how to send us your questions. It isn't hard. We'd just like you to say, hi, my name's Kathy. I'm from Vancouver, and my question for you is. So if you do use that format, hi, what's your name, where are you from, and what's your question to us? So. In this pre-time before the webcast starts at uh, 3.30, I'd like to draw your attention back to the I know, I think I know, and I want to know. There's a little box on the bottom and it says, what have been your successes and what are your challenges in using project-based learning? We'd like you to do some pre-thinking for us and we're going to come back to you with our live webcast beginning at 3.30. Thanks a lot. Hello, my name's Kathy Elliott and I work for the Ministry of Education. I welcome you today to our webcast on pro uh, project-based learning brought to you by the Ministry of Education, our early learning branch team. It's a second in a series that we are, brought, we are bringing to you. The first series featured Jane Bertrand and Stuart Shanker. They talked to us about uh, self-regulation. Today we have Susan Fraser with us and she's going to talk to us about project-based learning. This webcast will be brought to you in four sections. Each section will be followed by a reflection break where we will stop, reflect on the things that Susan has talked with us about, and we will also uh, be answering questions that you're sending to us from the audience around the province. It's easy to send us questions. If you just look at your computer screen, the bottom right-hand corner will have a little box that says questions. Type your questions in there to us. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and send your questions to us. No silly questions. They're all great questions. You can, nothing is silly or, or uh, uh, unacceptable to us, so just send us what you'd like to know more about. Uh, let me introduce our speaker to you today, Susan Fraser. Susan is an expert in the area of project-based learning in early and primary years. Sue is faculty emeritus at Douglas College in early childhood education. She's an instructor, a lecturer, a presenter nationally and internationally, speaking about the Reggio Emilia approach to learning in the early years. Her book, <laughs> Authentic Childhood Experiencing Reggio Emilia in the Classroom, is currently in its third edition. Congratulations, well, thank Sue. Thank you, just out this week. That's great. <laughs> And this book has been embraced by community sites, colleges, and universities in BC for instruction of early childhood educators in project-based learning. And Sue and I just want to tell you, if you'd like it, it's uh, put out by Nelson Canada, and it's in most college bookstores. <clears throat> Sue is a very giving person and volunteers and consults, devoting much time to mentoring those who develop our early and primary years educators. During this webcast, Sue will introduce us to project-based learning as a teaching method and explain how projects significantly impact the learning of our children. And remember, 
One doesn't need a Reggio classroom to practice what Sue is going to share with us today. The same processes and concepts apply in any classroom with children of any age. So we're pleased to welcome Sue today. Sue will talk with us about four parts. I, I was explaining to you the presentation will come to you in four parts. The first part is what is project-based learning? The second one is what are the steps to project-based learning? Then, how do you document projects? And lastly, how do you connect projects to learning outcomes? Sue, we're pleased to have you today. Welcome. Thank you, Kelly. Um, today we are here to discuss one of the most enjoyable and rewarding ways of working with children in the classroom. What is project-based learning? Two quotations, the first from Carol Ann Wien and the second from Steve Siddell, I think will help us answer this question, or at least set the stage for us to think about it. Project-based learning, says Carol Ann Wien, is not a single plan or for a unit to be followed by a pathway, but a sense of multiple possibilities and multiple routes to knowing, and many ways that teachers and children might choose together. And the second quotation from Steve Seidel says, Listening and teaching should not stand on opposite si sides of the river and just watch the water flow by. Instead, they should embark together on a journey down the river. So I hope this afternoon we will embark together on a journey down the river, not as pre presenter and teachers, but as a learning group of people who will share knowledge and experiences in the process of co-construction of learning. Let us begin talking briefly about Reggio Emilia, a small city in northern Italy in the Po Valley where they have created the most amazing approach to early childhood education. Much of what we discussed today will be inspired by the education developed in Reggio Emilia. Some of you have, may have joined the thousands of people already who have come from countries all over the world. I think every country, in, uh, just about every country has sent delegations to Reggio Emilia. Even the little country next door to where I come from, Namibia, has sent a delegation to Reggio Emilia. So it's become widely, widely, um, uh, in, people become from all over the world become very interested in it. We have to make schools a better place for children, and when people return from Re Reggio Emilia, this is what they want to do. I visited Reggio Emilia in 1993 with the very first delegation to travel to Reggio Emilia. It's just amazing to think of it now, but we tried all across Canada to get people to join the delegation. And you know we could only get 18 people. <laughs> only 18 people wanted to go in 1993. Now there's a, a delegation this year, and I believe it's over 250 people going. I could be wrong about my numbers, but I, it's a huge delegation. Um, the first delegation was very fortunate because we were able to listen to Loris Malaguzzi explain the approach. The approach started in 1945, so they had been developing it for many years before they became internationally famous. Um, Loris Malaguzzi was their leader in philosophy and he was an amazingly dynamic man and so passionately interested in, in making uh, education really um, dynamic for children. When I returned from Italy in 1993, I, I went again, by the way, in 2001. But when I returned in 1993, I was teaching at Douglas College in New Westminster and I realized that I thought when I went, I, I was pretty well you know, knowledgeable about education. But when I got there, I just realized I knew nothing. I knew absolutely nothing. I had to start and recreate my, my, um, my practice right from the, from the ground up. So when I returned to uh, Douglas College, the, the whole faculty had gone to Reggio Emilia. We totally revamped our program and we started what was called Children Teaching Teachers in which we invited uh, a grade one class, a kindergarten class, and the preschool classes in the, in, around uh, the college to attend the, um, the college one uh, morning a week, which is quite amazing. Wednesday morning, we have the children come and uh, the students planned activities and a program for the children. The faculty watched and then from our observations, we drew out the um, content for our, our classes. So we really began, not from the top down, as we'd always done from the theory to the practice, but from the practice to the theory. So we didn't really, really know it at the time, but we actually were becoming very postmodern. <laughs> we, we just did it because what we'd, what we'd seen in Reggio made us change our practice, and it's done that to so many people. So these are the principles that I brought back with me from Reggio Emilia in 1993. These are the ones that inspired me. That, these are not the only principles, but they're the ones that I particularly responded to as I observed their programs. Um, the, 
in my view, these were the principles that I felt were woven through every aspect of Reggio Emilia approach. Perhaps the most important thing to know about Reggio Emilia is that they have really integrated the theory and practice. And it, what they believe in and what they, their values are is woven into every aspect of their program. So it's very authentic. And that's why I call my book Authentic Childhood, because the whole thing you, you just feel is so authentic. It's in, awe-inspiring. So the first principle that I felt was really important to introduce into my teaching was respect. So respect is, is in many ways. It, everything in Reggio is, is sort of woven through so many different levels. Respect for families, for each other, for children, for culture, for community, for environment. And what I love, because I was an art teacher, was for the materials that they provide for children to use. The materials are really the, um, the materials that genuine artists would use. They don't consider children less worthy than a genuine artist. So beautiful, natural, beautiful, authentic materials, clay and paint, and oh, it's just amazing. But most important of all is respect given to each other's ideas and thinking. Children are, seen, uh, are, are respected for their intelligence, and that's, that's a really important point. Children are respected for their intelligence. Um, the second is relationship, and they would put relationship as the first principle. Um, relationship is the basis for collaboration between teachers, children, and their families, but it's also about placing learning in context and understanding the interconnection of all living things. And I think that's so important for us in this time and place, that we really care about all living things. Relationship is also an important principle in arranging environments that encourage children to work in small and large groups. So nothing is in, in isolation. Everything is in relationship. Um, reciprocity is a difficult one for us because it, is a, it lowers the hierarchy. It removes the hierarchy in the classroom. Um, it's to co-construct understandings, but this means that for teachers, teachers listen to children, and children listen to teachers. Teachers learn from children, and children learn from teachers. So there's this reciprocal going back and forth, a mutual exchange. And we know from practicing this that children teach us the most amazing things. You know, we can learn so much more from them, honestly, than they can learn from us. So the next one is representation, and I love this being an art teacher. Representation means using many different symbol systems, or as they say in Reggio Emilia, 100 languages of children's. So let's go beyond the three R's to let children learn from their kinesthetic body movements, from music, you know, and on the wide range of human, human endeavor. Let's broaden our base of, repre of, of representation. They call it 100 languages, which is metaphoric, right? And then the final one is one that I love as well is trans transparency. And this, of course, is through the documentation, but also in the way we communicate with us, in the honest way we talk to each other. And in Reggio Emilia, we learned that they do not, they are not afraid of conflict. That's the dynamic that moves them along. They really, the Italians are great at conflict. They really know how to <laughs> handle that. <laughs> we tend to shy away from it. I know I would but they get, meet it head on. So transport, uh, transparency is again, an imp it's, this is the beautiful part about Reggio Emilia. It is an important principle in the arrangement of space in the room. Light is everywhere, it shimmers, it glistens. It is played within the mirrors on the walls, mirrors even on the climbing frame that the children use in the classrooms, the little children. It's in the glass par partitions between rooms. Classrooms are not shut away with the door shut. They open, you know, they have great, they've taken walls out and put glass in. You can look into the classrooms. Children walk past and see their brothers and sisters um, working in the, in, the, in the classrooms. It's very open. Um, it is in, uh, transparently in reflected in the beautiful shiny objects on the mobiles. Everywhere there are mobiles twinkling in the, in the rooms. Um, it is most apparent in art materials for the children to use. They're light light tables, clear plastic sheets for murals, transparent inks, and everywhere you just sense this beautiful lightness. It gives you, you come away with such a joyful feeling. So those for me were the principles that I loved about Reggio Emilia. Can you see why when I came back and dreary old art activities that I'd had children painting, 
caterpillars on egg boxes <laughs> <laughs> were out the door. <laughs> this is a huge stretch. <laughs> now, at the very heart of the Reggio Emilia program, and this is something all of us have to really, really think carefully about, is their image, what they call the image of the child. It is the most important, I think if we are to do project-based learning, it's at the very core of what we have to do. We have to think deeply and reflect on our, the image that we hold of children. Do we view children as competent, inventive, capable, and rich in ideas that are really worth listening to? Or do we see them as needy and needing to be taught? If this is our view of children, they're competent, capable, rich, and worth listening to, then it will have a great impact on our role of teachers because what it's going to do to us, it's going to turn us into listeners, huh? and not what I'm doing to you, talking. <laughs> we will want to hear what children have to say because they have amazing ideas, mm -hmm. as can be seen from the following projects, truly amazing. It will affect the materials we, we provide for them because we, we want these to support their capabilities and intelligence. And I think if you take one idea away from this, think about materials as being intelligent. Don't give children gimmicky things to do. Give them really solid, intelligent materials. The clay, the paint, the graphic tools, that's what children really need to be real artists. It will mean to cre create environments then to allow them to be inventive and represent their ideas. Their ideas, not the teacher's ideas, their ideas. Um, this has an impact on timetables, of course, because children will need flexible time to work on their projects in both small and large groups. For project work to be a satisfying experience for all concerned, the teacher has to value the children's ideas and contributions and set up procedures to ensure all these factors are incorporated into the everyday experiences in the room. So can you see why that image of the child is so important? The next point uh, in project-based learning is to careful consideration of the, of the values we hold about working with children Values are indeed personal, and uh, we know that in Reggio Emilia they have values maybe that we were not our values, but you know, we were on the same uh, page, but maybe different uh, interpretations. But what, to give you some examples, we were, made in Reg we were made aware of how much the teachers in Reggio Emilia va valued democracy. And when they talked about democracy in Re Reggio Emilia, they really meant democracy. Everybody in the room had a voice and were listened to. You know, in our rooms, it's a teacher's voice that's the strongest. But if you're thinking about reciprocity, all voices are equal in the room. So de de democracy for the Italians was really an important value. The other one that we loved and hadn't, I had never given any consideration to was aesthetics. You know, the children deserve beautiful environments, and they provided them for the children. They thought about every single square meter of the classroom and in the sense of does this reflect our values of beautiful environments for children? If we respect children, we have to provide them with those beautiful environments. And in the, in the, acti the activities they offer children and, they, and in the way they in, arrange their classroom space. As I said earlier, when, when I work with schools, not even the parents want to leave the classroom. They're so beautiful as, as, as aesthetics, if, if aesthetics becomes a part of their value system. So you can see why we came back stunned, absolutely stunned, by the beautiful classrooms we had visited. You know, our classrooms were practical, but they're not beautiful, huh? They're changing, though. Awareness of what children bring with them when they step through the door of the classroom. The values of the culture, community, and families of the children come from when they enter your classroom. Consider now the values you believe are important in working with children. Think about how you manage space and time. For instance, do you take time to listen to children's thoughts and ideas? Have you arranged your classroom space for group work? Does the environment you create for children's learning reflect the values that you think are important? So perhaps begin with one small area of the classroom and ask yourself, what message does this area of the classroom convey to children? For instance, if it's filled with commercial posters rather than the children's own work, whose thinking is valued in your classroom? Do the materials you provide for children support the values you have identified as important? For instance, for me, I have learned because of my inspiration from Reggio Emilia, I want to see materials that are open-ended and support children's intelligence. 
authentic materials like clay and paint and graphic tools. I've covered that already. I would want to see children's own intelligence at work in the way each child responds to the materials. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to see a teacher's idea and 20 snowmen on the, on the wall. I'd want to see the children's idea of what a snowman was. And, and their idea of what a snowman is, is amazing. So examine your schedule to ensure that it reflects the values you identified. For instance, if collaboration is a value, have you made time for group work? So the following two projects help us think about the way culture, community, and families can affect the interests that children bring with them when they enter your classroom door. The Bean Project. The Bean and Bridge Project both show how the interests of children who live in the country, the, the Bean Project, and the Bridge, children who live in the city might differ. So you'll be thinking of the children who come into your classrooms and what they bring in through the door. The Bean Project was carried out by a group of children on Quadra Island. And the teacher just started off with the thing that I've done a thousand times. We planted beans in jars, right? And then when the jars began to grow, because the children were following Reggio Emilia and thinking about questioning, they asked the children, how high do you think your beans are going to grow? And the children had all sorts of different ideas about how high their beans were going to grow. So we observed the beans. I was working along with the teachers at this time for, you know, for, a few, for a couple of weeks or two or three weeks. And the beans began to grow and began to get wriggly like this. So we asked the children, what do you think we should do with the beans now? Well, most of, in my day, we just sent them home and said, you know, parents, you deal with it. But, we now, <laughs> but now we have respect for living things, right? So we thought about how can we look after these beans? How can we care for these beans? Ha, oh, let's build them a teepee, said the children, that they, or poles that we can climb up and it turned into a teepee. So out the children went. They designed the teepee with the, with the teacher, and then they got to work to build it. They planted it, and it turned into the most beautiful shelter as the weather got warmer for children to sit in and read books or share a snack. It was truly a beautiful experience. And then the children started asking what else they could do to their playground. Huh? We've made this part so beautiful, and it, was, it came from them. What else can we do to our playground? And who else lives in our playground? You know, let's, and they became really interested in their playground and redesigning their playground. And so started the project, and the second project took off from this, the invitation to the garden project. And this was really fun because the children started talking about all the things that they could invite into their playground, and they wanted to invite the birds. And they thought, how could they invite the birds? And they decided to build clay um, uh, bird baths for the birds. But these bird baths were so, so delightful. They actually were what the children would want in the bird bath. And they became like little miniature swimming pools with slides <laughs> and balls and floaters. And <laughs> anyway, they had a wonderful time. But can you, I, I hope these show you how we've, they followed the, the children's lead. And who would mm -hmm. think the children of creating bird baths that became little swimming pools for birds? Now, the bridge project was the one in the city. Early in the school year, the Vancouver Child Study Center noted the children's interest in building bridges with the blocks. Now, the blocks they built, the bridges they built with the blocks, we don't know where the idea of bridges came, but they were all using them, were very wobbly bridges. And we talked with the children. I was again working with this group of children. And they had no ramps, and you know, there was, there was a lot to learn about bridges. So the teachers read the Three Billy Goats Gruff story. And the children began to think seriously about things that go over bridges and how you get onto mm -hmm. bridges. In fact, we asked one little girl how you get onto a bridge, and she says, you go, one, two, three, hop, and you're on. <laughs> 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 um, the, they build, and after they, the children had read, um, the, uh, listened to the story of the three Billy Goats Gruff, their building, bridge building became really intense. You know, they were mm -hmm. very interested in it. So the teacher thought of a wonderful idea, and this is called a provocation and involve the families, which is another principle we really like to do. They asked the families to take the children to visit bridges in Vancouver. This is Vancouver, right? And we have wonderful bridges in Vancouver. So the parents set over with the children during the next uh, couple of weeks to look at bridges in Vancouver, which is a wonderful way of, of uh, involving the parents. And they brought photographs back to school of the different bridges. But the children had one bridge in mind, and that's our most famous bridge, right? Lionsgate Bridge. They wanted to build Lionsgate Bridge, which was daunting for the teachers. How do you actually, <laughs> you know, what have we done here? How do you possibly construct a suspension bridge? Anyway, they brought in books, and in no time at all, the children actually had developed, had built a suspension bridge. It was, in, I, I mean, amazing, amazing. 
that four-year-old children could really, and, uh, you know, if you can see from the slide, they worked on it, they, mm -hmm. and they figured it out, and you'll see the book in the background. They were looking at the book, mm -hmm. figuring out how to do it. And then one little girl came running up with two lumps of clay in her hands. You know what they were? The lions, right? She had made the lions totally spontaneously. So I think you might be able to just see on the photograph the lions. So it was a wonderful project. They then went ahead and built a big um, bridge in the classroom out of chairs and, and ropes and things. But the funnest part of all was, it, this was summertime, it was come at the end of the school year, and the teachers took the whole building project outside. You know, when, you, when a project really gets going, it keeps going for quite a long time if there's real in energy and enthusiasm. So out the bridges went into the playground, and we made a stream for the children. We invited in an expert in bridge building, an engineer, and he brought his materials in, wood and metal and scraps, and we built bridges for the rest of the school year out in the playground. <laughs> and they were amazing. You know, we had a miniature Vancouver with its mi millions of bridges out there in the playground. So in the last few slides, we have seen how the image of the child is competent, inventive, and brimful of interesting ideas was fundamental in each of the projects we looked at. But how important it is to follow children's ideas we would never have gone. We, who would ever have thought of building a suspension bridge in the classroom? And, and where it led us into, and the joy of it, the joy of those children and, the, and those bridges. So you can see how the children who live in the country were excited by the country things, and the children who lived in the city were excited about the city things. And it's not as though sometimes the children who live in the city would be interested in growing beans, because they might be. But it was mm -hmm. just interesting that the two fo uh, projects I followed took those different paths. <coughs> so I think we have to realize how the community, the culture in which children live, affect their interests. Now, Kathy, I think it's a time for a break. I've talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely have not <laughs> talked too much. What a wonderful way to bring project-based learning to life. It, it has such a clear vision to me now. It's, it's very, very uh, remarkable. Thank you so much, Sue. So in section one, Sue talked to us about what is project-based learning. We'd like you to take a few minutes and to ponder the, the people, the young people in your care and think about what kinds of interests do the children currently have. We'd like you also to think about how you could translate these interests into projects. So we'll let you have a few minutes and in our studio audience we'll be doing the same thing. I urge you to keep your questions coming in. I know that they're coming in at our printer at our back of our room, so keep those questions coming to us. And Sue, we'll have a little break while people ponder <laughs> these questions. Thank you. Hi. We've got some questions that have been coming in to us. We thank you for that. The first question that Sue has chosen to answer is from Sarah from Nanaimo. And she said, I'm currently an early childhood educator, and my passion is the Re Reggio Emilia philosophy. But can you tell me, how do I get my staff motivated and interested in this philosophy? Stu, how do you motivate people? <laughs> well, the way I have worked with this question in the past is to get this, uh, the group to meet us, uh, you know, to meet, uh, meet at a comfortable time for them, so there's lots of time, we're not hurried, and to talk about what we really value for children to think about what our values are. And it, this is a long process. It doesn't, take, it doesn't happen in one meeting, two or three meetings. We really need to go well into, into depth about what do we really want for our children. And it's amazing, again, you see the different um, the country schools I worked with, the city schools, you know, have different kinds of values, but they were all important. And once they have come up with a shared value, and that takes a long time to get a shared value with the team of teachers you're working with, of course, I'm talking now preschool teachers who work in a team, but you could also do this in a, in a school and, and have the different grades join you. Um, then you begin to look at, as I talked earlier, look at your environment and see whether those, the values that you think are important are reflected in every square meter of your environment. You then look at your schedule, or you can do it in any order you want, and you see if the values are reflected in the schedule. So if you believe that children should have a long time to work on their ideas, then you think about your scheduling. You know, do ch are there long pa passages of time in the day when children can work on, on these, on these uh, ideas of theirs? So it's just looking at your values and then seeing that these values are reflected in every part of the, your program. 
This is the way Reggio Emilia did it, and they say to us, you can't accept our values as your values. You have to do it from the bottom up yourselves, the way they did it. And it's a slow process, but it's a very, very rewarding process. And it's a very important re relationship process. You know, the, I found that the teachers that I worked with during this process are still working together, you know, because they have a real trust and a, a strong relationship with each other. It works. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Sarah, for that question. Now we have a question from our studio audience. Uh, we have a nice contingency here of people from Maple Ridge, and Sheila from Maple Ridge asks you, Sue, how do we support teachers to trust that children will be motivated and that children will progress? How do we ask teachers, how do we support them so that they can trust that? I think the, f the first thing is become listeners to children. And when, when you listen to children, there's some ordinary moments that you, you know, that just motivate you. This is incredible. I remember watching a little fellow uh, just tracing some sand that in, in a storm had bounced up with the sand onto, the, onto the, the fence around the playground, and he was tracing the pattern. So I took a photograph of it, we brought it inside, and we started a, a project on sand. You know, it was just a simple little thing like that. So that was just, you know, would you think that would motivate everybody? But the whole class became interested in sand, uh, doing art with sand, investigating sand. We even found that, do you know that the sand on the beaches in around uh, up there are, is magnetic <laughs> in, the, in the Gulf Islands in the northern? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we, we made some incredible discoveries ourselves just investigating sand, mm -hmm. just from a child tracing a sand picture. So it's very exciting to listen for ordinary moments and motivate them. And what is the other one? We'll be motivated and, and progress. And they will progress, yes. Well, they prog I mean, they don't even need to progress because when you start in a, an exciting project mm. like this, you're left behind and they, <laughs> <laughs> they, they suddenly de designing a, s a suspension bridge, you know. That's way beyond anything we as people can do. It's astonishing, astonishing. So I just think this way of working with children in the classroom is just very exciting. And the things you want to happen, happen. <laughs> Trust it. Mm -hmm. And I think we have time for one more question. So this comes from our studio audience also. Norley from Maple Ridge asks, how do we apply Reggio concepts in the BC context? Well, this is interesting because once again, you know, the, the people in Reggio Emilia have handed it over to us and say, you have to work this out for yourself. You can't take our program and dump it down on top of you. You have to do this from the bottom up. And I find that it's through the materials, I think, for me, mm -hmm. because I'm an art teacher, mm -hmm. that you can apply Reggio concepts. I think if we provide children with really intelligent materials, it, this leads us into looking at the aesthetics, at the relationship, at the respect, and all the principles of Reggio come together. I know this is very personal, but this is a personal way of, of teaching, right? Mm -hmm. And I would do it myself through, the, through having beautiful, authentic materials that you really support children's intelligence. That's the way I believe. Of course, they, you know, one, you'd have to do it the way that works for you. you. I think it's becoming familiar with the Reggio approach. There are wonderful, wonderful books written about Reggio. Really read about it, learn about it, and, uh, and attend conferences. There are conferences. Uh, you know, we're bringing the 100 languages of children here in 2012. Mm -hmm. That'll be a wonderful way to learn about Reggio. So it's, it's so joyful, and people enjoy you know, they just It's just a very um, joyful process. I hope I've answered that. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. And we also are going to be re-answering these questions and all the other questions that come in when we uh, archive the materials. So mm -hmm. there you'll get another chance actually to take a look at that. So we're getting ready now to head into section two of our webcast, where Sue, we're looking forward to hearing you set out some steps to guide uh, teachers as they begin to plan for these projects with children. So over to you for section okay. two. <laughs> Well, now um, we have, we have um, looked briefly at how project learning emerges from listening, observing, and responding to children's interests. Let us think about what kind of environment promotes project-based learning. And I think if we look closely at the slides, the, couple of sli the few slides that we have following, and think of all the possibilities it has for engaging children in collaborative project work. Notice the raised platforms for children to work on. 
This was a very respectful way because if children build an interesting building, nobody's going to run through it and knock it over. And if children build on a platform, it can stay up, right, when the cleaners come in and clean the room. So it's a respectful way of uh, valuing children's work. Um, note, note the mirrors on the walls around where the children are building so that the children now, they've, they've been, we, I've seen buildings built on mirrors so you get the perspective of looking down and looking up, looking laterally, horizontally, vertically, vertically. So it's encouraging children to have multiple perspectives of their work. Um, note the documentation on the walls Without documentation, I don't really believe we can be effective with project learning, but we'll come to that later on. Look at the easel, and we talk, talked about relationship. You see, so many of us have used easels in sol uh, single easels for painting, but this uh, school has a, four, a three, a th I think it's a three-person easel to encourage the relationship, to encourage the talking back and forth. Um, the next slide shows a painting area, and I love this one because there's a, a provocation on the middle of the table. It's set out on the middle of the table called Taking Flight. It's an art, art print. And this is set up pe perhaps to stimulate children to work um, on, I think there's, it's a collage print. So there's a lot, of, a lot of collage materials on the table, glue, paper, and so forth, that the children can bring many different mediums to, to their art. And I loved it because the teacher's not too concerned about messiness. <laughs> it's OK, you know. The paint might spill over onto the table. Um, there's a, uh, the, in the, in the, on the other slide, there's a light table with transparent materials, which encourage children to explore light and color, as they do so, in, so many times in Reggio Emilia. This reminds me of the, the transparencies the teachers provided for the children to familiarize themselves with the buildings in Toronto before they went on their field trip downtown. So this is a way you can involve older children to have a light table and transparencies. So the children examined the important buildings that they were going to visit. I don't know Toronto very well, but you'd know the, probably the buildings they'd visit through transparencies on the light table. So an interesting way. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, to continue, before beginning a project, therefore, create spaces where children are encouraged to work in groups and spaces where children can work quietly on their own. Enco uh, encourage involvement, ensure that fam families feel welcome in the classroom. All the projects I refer to in this presentation were enriched by contributions from the families of the children involved. Um, it was the potters on, Gal on Quadra Island who uh, fired the children's um, be uh, beautiful bird bars. Everybody pitched in to help. Ensure that, uh, and ensure that relationship is at the heart of all that happens in the classroom. For groups both small and large to work well, there has to be a sense of we. As you talked, somebody talked about trust early on, we have to trust each other. The team of teachers has to trust each other because quite often you hand over mm. power back and forth. Uh, we have to get to know each other's strengths well enough to know, you know who's, who would be the best person to do this work. Um, and children have to get to know each other's strengths as well because they'll be working with them in a, 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 as they continue, out the, continue on with the project. So which, one, which person would be the best person to take this um, job on? And then, of course, also to help each other when, they, when a child needs help. In one of the projects I was looking, there was, it was a circus project. I was looking at it, I was observing it was a circus project, and one of the little children vote, was voted in as the um, circus, what do they call the circus master, you know? The, and the other children knew that she was a very shy little girl. So they, one of the children stood up and said, we'll have a double circus. What do they call the ringmaster? Mm -hmm. We'll ringmaster, we'll wear two hats. You wear one and I'll wear one and I'll hold your hand. And I thought there was a tremendous empathy because, you know, this little, why they voted her in, we could never figure, but <laughs> you know, we were practicing democracy, right? And she was the one voted in. Um, but it's wonderful when children work in groups that they get to know that about each other and teachers as well. So before beginning a project to continue, encourage a sense of partnership between children and teachers in the classroom, and we've been talking about that. Ensure that there are many opportunities for the exchange of ideas among the group. So you can see how this is going to affect the scheduling and the way you organize your space. Setting up desks in lines is not going to work if you're going to be sharing and exchanging ideas with each other. And then, as we talked about earlier, document ordinary moments. It's from these ordinary moments that amazing things happen. Mm -hmm. So you probably need to be flexible about story or circle time. 
sometimes these times can become a time for discussion about future plans or ideas for another project or sub-project. But very important is an opportunity to revisit documentation to perhaps seek a new direction for a project. So it's to ground us all, the documentation during the discussion times grounds us in where we're at and where we need to go next. So ideas for projects. Teachers often ask, how do I find out about what might be an idea for a project? Well, from, for, from my experience, it's of course documenting those ordinary moments, but observe children's play and involvement in the classroom. And we'll see this in the Castle and Night project that I'll discuss a little later on. Listen closely to con children's conversations. They often have amazing ideas. And then ask children questions. For older children, setting up a thinking table stocked with possible ideas such as photographs, books, transparencies, as they did in the Toronto, the unit on the, on the city in Toronto, may help the teacher discover what topics or subtopics the children might become interested in. And as I said um, in the unit on the city with Carol Ann Wien's book, putting the transparencies of the buildings out. Test your ideas by setting up one or more provocations or challenges that may include Suggestions by the teacher to draw or paint what the children appear to be showing an interest in. So in the bridge project, we got a lot of, um, we got many children to do, we got some of the children rather to draw pictures of how they imagined the bridges to be. We figured out that they really didn't know much about bridges. They didn't know that bridges had ramps and that's when we got the wonderful story about one, two, three, jump. That's how you get on a bridge. Um, carefully selected m materials that encourage children to make their thinking visible. So I found that bringing in wire in the um, Cast and Night project was a wonderful pro project for making crowns for the, I, I come from Africa and the children make wire toys in Africa, right? So I've had a lot of experience with wire. And I took the wire into the Cast and Night project and that set off a whole new mm -hmm. um, direction for the project using wire crowns and so forth. Mm -hmm. A planned activity based on the teacher's hunches about what be, could be engaging to the children each year a quest to parents to take the children to visit the bridges in Vancouver. So this is a hunch you have. Children are really interested in bridges, so let's go and visit bridges and see if they come back uh, really inspired. Um, after uh, uh, testing ideas for potential projects with children, assess the children's level of interest or enthusiasm for the topic in question. Are children really enthusiastic about this topic? Listen carefully to their conversation. What were they painting? Um, l watch their play. And then a, a good idea is to co-create an idea web to determine possible subtopics. And you can do this as a team or just as on your own, or you can do this with the children. Um, we found that we had a wonderful um, time with the Cast at Night project because we got the children to make a material web themselves to think about, now if we're going to build a class in the classroom, what, what materials do we need? And they came up with these amazing ideas. And uh, then we, they took these ideas, this back to the families, and the families started sending in other uh, materials that they had uh, listed on the list. Um, sometimes a web will allow children from different cultural backgrounds to make their own unique contribution that you may never have thought of. The children on, on, in Quadra, on Quadra Island were making uh, masks out of paper mache, and one of the Aboriginal children said, I'll ask my, um, my, my uncle if he'll come in and, and show us the, his mask. So Max Chickite came in to show us his masks, which was amazing. The most amazing thing is he enjoyed his time so much he didn't want to leave. So he stayed, and this was a miracle. He stayed, and, he, and the children went down with him to the beach, and they brought back a piece of driftwood, and he made an octopus for the school. And he said, in our culture, an octopus means change. Mm -hmm. And for me, to see a school like this means so much change. I never went to a school like this and that my, my niece and nephew are going to. Wasn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. So they have one of the best Aboriginal artists' mm -hmm. um, carvings in their classroom, which is mm -hmm. treasured, I can tell you. Um, the following four slides will give you an example of quite a simple project that children in Marpole Oak Ridge Preschool in South Vancouver carried out with their four-year-old children. The project was called A Rainbow Came to Play. Oh. Well, you know, we get an awful lot of rain in Vancouver and on one <laughs> sunny day when the children could go out into the playground, the teachers, who are amazing to me, they gave the children a clear 
uh, materials that they could look through. So they collected a, a mm -hmm. took a, ba a basket of different kind of materials, transparent materials for the children to go out and look through. And they just wondered where this would lead. Well, it had the most amazing result because the children suddenly discovered they could make a rainbow with some of these materials. Mm -hmm. It was sunny for the first time in weeks. Mm -hmm. They were so excited. Now you must remember these children don't share, many of them immigrant children, this is Marpole Oak Ridge in South Vancouver, so they don't share a common language, but they could make rainbows together. Mm -hmm. And so the excitement, and they were sharing their excitement, and um, they were so excited about this that they came back into the classroom, or back, and w wanted to make rainbows everywhere. And one of the ways they did that was to hang um, p uh, cellophane paper on the fence, outside their, the deck outside their classroom, and the sun made ra uh, rainbows on the on the deck of the, class, of the classroom outside. Um, and then because Vancouver has so much rain, they thought they'd better invite the rainbow inside. Mm -hmm. So they invented a black box with a, with a flashlight and CD discs inside, and the children had a wonderful time making their own rainbows. Then they built clear plastic objects in the room on an on a, a overhead projector and projected a rainbow on the wall and had a great time with that. In the meantime, they were really Exploring color, they had colored water, mixing color, um, colored paper collages, and uh, really investigating color and how to mix color. And then the teachers decided that they wanted to take it into another language. Remember, Reggio Emilia with its hundred languages, so they set up uh, f uh, beautiful fabrics from the ceiling, and the children danced with a rainbow and sang rainbow songs. It was the most joyful exploration of rainbows and it continued on for nearly a month. And the learning was amazing because while all this joy was happening, there was some real solid learning about colors, but also because these children do not share a, a common language, mm -hmm. it was a wonderful way to get them com um, communicating with each other. As they say in Reggio Emilia, nothing without joy. Just to mm -hmm. walk into the classroom was so joyful. So, um, what is a successful project? What, what, what are the characteristics? And I'm taking this from Giovanni Piazza, who's one of the most amazing uh, teachers in Reggio Emilia who does incredible projects with the children. He's the one that did the amusement park for the birds that has gone on now for um, a decade. You know, in the amusement park for the birds, the children made um, all, they, they talk, they, the, the teachers wanted the children actually to build, build bird houses for the birds and the, teach, the children said, no, that's boring. We want to make an amusement park for the birds. <laughs> so, the so Giovanni said, well, what is an amusement park for the birds? They said, well, we've got to have roundabouts and fountains and a big wheel and, and a cafeteria. <laughs> and so <laughs> he set to work with the children to make that. He's an amazing man. So when we went to Reggio Emilia in 2001, he did a presentation for the Canadian delegation. And it was talking about exactly the topic we're talking about today and what is a successful project. And he says for a successful project, and I think this is one of the most important pieces of information to come out of Reggio Emilia, in my opinion. And a successful project has big overarching ideas there needs to be a big idea that energizes the group. You know, something that was really important to the children. Um, something that if children really need to know the answer to something, like how do you build a suspension bridge, they're going to become very motivated to find out. But they have to really have some investment in the, in the, in the answer. How do you do it? The second point, he said, is ideas that generate passion in both the children and teacher. It's not much fun for children if the teacher's ho-hum about it. The <laughs> teacher has to be really passionate herself, and then it becomes a learning group that just moves along at a great, in interesting, uh, in enthusiastic pace. It has to have a lot of surface area, and that, what he meant by that is the topic must sustain the children's interest over a period of time and give them lots of different pathways. As you can see from the bridge project, you know, they built bridges, a suspension bridge, and they built a classroom bridge, and then they took the whole bridge outside, and they built many different kinds of bridges outside. So it had lots of surface area. And uh, topics that have many different paths for children to follow. So children might do sub-projects that go this way or that way, but there is usually a unifying major idea that they move along together. And, and I have got time to talk about the window project. 
This is Giovanni's, I'll do this very quickly. Sure. When we were in Reggio Emilia, I think one of the most interesting projects, other than the amusement park for the birds that we saw, was Giovanni's window project. And I love it because it began at the end of the school year when the children went home for the holidays. He sent them all home with a little bag and writing on the bag was, bring us back some memories of your holiday in your little bag. Mm -hmm. So when the children came back in September to school, they bought their little bags, they put them on the floor, and guess what? Not a bit interested in them. But what they were interested in is talking about what they'd seen through the train windows of, the, of when they journeyed up in, you know, in Italy, you have to go everywhere on the train, right? And there was interesting discussions about what they'd seen through the train window and what people had seen in the train window as well. So Giovanni, who's very flexible, tossed the idea of the bags and mementos and went with windows. And he began to think, now how can we investigate windows? And I love this because he gave the children cameras and he sent them out to uh, take pictures of windows. You know, Italy has wonderful windows, right? But this, uh, the school that he teaches in is La Vieta School. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. It's a very old building. It was one of the original schools. And it's four, floor, uh, four or five floors. And there's a basement floor and an attic floor. And he suggested to the children that they took pictures from the different floor windows, mm -hmm. so from the, from the basement windows, and then compare their windows. Well, the children were just so interested in comparing their windows, and they began to talk about windows. And they talked about um, windows that were sunny windows, green windows, fresh air windows, a window for a cat. <laughs> this, is, this is what they had found out as they investigated windows. Um, they, they had found a friendship window. Uh, a friendship window is a double window that opens, right? Mm -hmm. And they were so excited about windows. So Giovanni said it puzzled him where to go next with this. And then he thought to himself, why don't we make windows? Why don't we make windows that you could look in, uh, in, in to the room and out of the room? So he brought in materials, and this is why I think selecting materials are mm -hmm. so important. He brought in plexiglass, clay, and wood for the children. They began to build their own windows. And then the child who was wanting to build a fresh air window, he thought, now, how is he going to, I mean, it was easy to build a green window because it was a, a window box, right? But what would be a fresh air window? How would you give children the materials to build a fresh air window, right? And Giovanni is such a, an, a you know, master at this. He thought, wispy, woolly mm. material. And sure enough, when he brought that in, that child said that was his, his uh, fresh air window. And the wispy woolly material was the fresh air coming into the window. Mm -hmm. You see how important materials are? And it's not that only the children have ideas, but it's also the teachers have, who have ideas and support the children. So I love that story. I wanted to share it because it just shows the importance of windows. And also where the teacher's ideas go nowhere, but the children really have wonderful ideas. So once a topic has been uh, decided on, educators can reflect on the following. Does the project provide opportunities for children to collect lots of information that will further their interest in the topic? And uh, Giovanni said, if children begin to think in a metaphoric way about the t a topic, as they did in the windows when they thought of friendship windows, then you know that you've really hit the jackpot with your project, right? Metaphoric thinking, thinking is amazing. Um, it's what we want to encourage with children, according to him. We learn so much from the educators in Reggio Emilia. And then does the project give the children opportunities to, to use a wide variety of materials to create, rep to create representational work, the 100 languages of children, right? And will the topic provide lots of opportunity for collaboration? Because remember we said that relationship is at the heart of all we do. So I think, again, I've talked too much. It's over to you, Kathy. <laughs> now would be a good time so. for a you break. Have, everyone in our <laughs> audience is just kind of looking at you with <laughs> rapture. So, but how authentic is this work and how genuine yeah, for the kids and for the and, teachers? And so diverse. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to give you, around the province and in our studio audience, a few moments to reflect on some of what uh, Sue has been sharing with us. We've got some questions that we'd like you to ponder, although you've given us lots to think about. So <laughs> these are just our guides for you. If you have other things to discuss, please do. But uh, the first one we'd like you to think about is, think about your classroom and the schedule. What changes would you make to ensure there is time and space for this project-based learning? Second one you could think about, how can you support project-based learning in a classroom where space is limited? 
Right. So I think there's, you've given us lots of ideas. And the third one, what are strategies you can think of for involving families in the project? And when we come back, Sue's going to take us into thinking more deeply about some of those things and about families' involvement. So we'll come back to you in about five minutes. Send your questions to us. We'd, be love, we'd love to take your questions. So we'll see you again in about five minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, we're back with you. I think we have an anonymous email, either that or we can't quite figure out who this is from. Multiple questions here, but let's just start with the first one, Sue. It said, so many of our preschool slash daycares limit the types of projects they do because they feel that children will be challenging behaviors, that children with challenging behaviors either do not respond or do not respect the work of others. Do you find that the regio environment and the way that children's learning is viewed helps to decrease the behavior that adults find challenging? Well, my experience is that when you create a regio environment with relationship at the core and respect for children, honestly challenging behaviors disappear. Um, just to give you a quick example, I remember we tried to have more authentic materials in the housekeeping, housekeeping corner at the Vancouver Child Study Center. So we went down to Chinatown and brought um, beautiful you know, Chinese bowls, all China, and we put them in the housekeeping corner and we thought we had a very rambunctious group of boys and we thought you know, they won't last very long. It was so sweet. The first day they came to school, they had one look at the China ornament, uh, the China dishes and they tiptoed through the housekeeping corner. Mm -hmm. And we had no more rambunctious boys from then on. It, mm -hmm. That's really a true story. So I, I just know if you put relationship and respect at the core of your program, it just seems to work magic with challenging behaviors. I've seen it in every single school I've worked with. And this, you may have just answered the next part of this mm -hmm. question, but it's, it's a cool question, so I'd mm -hmm. like you to, have, to just tell me if you have. The second part of this question from Anonymous is, is it the Reggio belief that challenging behaviors are a clue to change the child? Or is it the view that challenging behaviors are a challenge for the adults to look at the environment and make changes that support children? I think that it's the environment, you know, absolutely the environment. If you change, look how we change the housekeeping corner to make more authentic materials and the children, because we had been, I think we'd respected the children, they respected the materials and the behavior disappeared immediately. Mm -hmm. no, I, I think it, I think it's uh, the adults have to change. Yeah, it's definitely the adults and the environment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the scheduling, not, not hurry, hurrying children, giving mm -hmm. them more relaxed time. It works. It honestly works in every school I've worked with. In fact, it's a long time since I've seen challenging behaviors <laughs> because I've been wow. working in Reggio Emilian uh, environments. I don't think I've seen it for a long time. Wow, that's I think amazing. the beauty in the environment, I mean, when we made the housekeeping corner beautifully, beautiful, the children's behavior responded to that beauty. It's amazing. Great. Just before we proceed with the uh, next segment of the webcast, we've had some questions about technical support, either the sound or the picture. If you look underneath the picture, you'll see a link for technical support. We just urge you to go to that link, link on, and it'll guide you through for technical support, any of you having difficulty. So, Sue, now we're going to go deeper into the next section here. And we're going to look at how to expand on material selection, how to support groups of children, and my favorite one is how families can participate mm -hmm. in this. So, where you go. Well, I'm going to leave out the list of selection of materials because I've covered that mm -hmm. quite extensively. And I'd like to move to Catherine McCain's kindergarten program, classroom rather in Powell River that I visited this uh, last year. When I arrived at the door, I, I had tears in my eyes because we, I was welcomed at the door by a flutter of butterflies on a beautiful panel outside the door that the children had made all out of natural materials. It was truly beautiful. Um, Catherine told me that she believes if, a, if art is a child's first literacy, then nature is their classroom. Mm -hmm. And I thought how important that is in the world again because we want children to really respect nature and care about it. Every week, because this is a country environment again, uh, Kath, Catherine takes the children on a walk through the forest that surrounds the school. And in this way, the children gather their own materials and repl replenish the ones in the classroom. Um, when the children create art using these natural materials, she, natural material, she says, they're learning to look closely, to pay attention to details, to discover patterns and textures, 
to think about possibilities, to make transformations, all essential to the creative process. In her classroom, to quote Mara Krzyzewski in the book Making Learning Visible, which is on your reading list, um, Mara, uh, Mara writes, beauty and pleasure are strongly integrated into the knowledge building process. And I think that's a really important quote for us. And it's certainly very evident in, in Catherine's classroom in Power River. Beauty and pleasure are strongly integrated into the knowledge building process. I think how many times in, in our schools do we, I mean in my schooling, knowledge was, was a painful process. What about making it a beautiful and pleasurable process? Isn't that amazing? In the photographs in this slide, note the birds made from pine cones that the children themselves had collected, from rose hips and feathers. Note particularly the alphabet and number lines made from natural materials, such as sticks and arbutus, berries, etc. And the documentation, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to read this because it's such a beautiful documentation. Mm -hmm. um, she's, Catherine wrote on her doc, document pa, uh, documentation panel, apple seeds, linden leaves, one red Japanese maple, one cotton Easter berry, and one pumpkin seed were all that M needed to change these natural materials into something magical. This fairy with the apple seed hair is becoming a mother because inside her tummy is a baby says M emphatically. It is magic. M spent 90 minutes working on this fairy. She was totally engaged and lost in another world apart from this one. She worked meticulously on placing each seed individually in place. She was quiet and very self-contained, never looking up from her work at hand. When she finished, her face shone with pride and she said to me, she is very beautiful. The other children worked on their fairies but spent far less time. I was amazed at the variety, says Catherine, of composition. Some of the fairies sport wings, others do not have wings. Some of the fairies have legs and arms, most have fe uh, faces with features. Catherine wrote in the documentation, that she, this is the analysis part of the documentation, that she believes using the natural material suits the subject of fairies. She states that it needed something soft, ephem ephemeral, and transitory in nature. Catherine herself as an artist. Gossamer wings made of linden leaves that are almost skeletons, seeds that hint at what they might become, like a wish. Necks made with the stems of leaves, delicate and fragile, almost too smooth to hold up the pumpkin seed heads of the fairies. So many children chose the pumpkin seed for the heads of the fairies. Isn't that a lovely piece of documentation? Mm -hmm. It just reads like a poem. So I want, this is another very important piece coming from Reggio Emilia, I think that inspires us and, and relates to Catherine's classroom. Tiziana Filippina, one of the um, atelieristas in, in uh, Reggio Emilia, is interviewed, and the interview is in the book, In the Spirit of the Studio. She, they, she says, in, more or less everyone in the autumn explores leaves. Pedagogy suggests working with children on how to represent the leaf and and on the leaf's relationship to the tree through observing the leaf in the natural world. In fact, pedagogy supports any, an idea that knowledge as a reproduction of an object, i.e. scientific, right, scientific mm -hmm. facts. Instead, in Reggio Emilia and our ateliers, listen to this carefully, we encourage the child to enter into a relationship with the leaf and activate processes of re-elaboration and reinvention, metaphoric expression, using analogies and poetic languages to build a personal image of the leaf. That is what I feel Catherine McLean does in the Fairy Project, right? Re-elaboration, a reinvention, and, f and developing a personal relationship with that leaf. That's what I feel that's what, passionately that that's what we want children to do. Rather than learn the scientific facts about leaf, which is a, a objective, right? Let's have a subjective relationship with the leaves. So we care about leaves, we care about trees, we care about our forests. That's where it begins. I, I just feel it's so important in this world that we do that with children. So for me, that's one of the most important pieces of information that spoke to me so, so loudly. And then Rodari, also from Reggio Emilia, says, to neglect imagination is to impoverish children's worlds and to narrow their hopes. And that's what Catherine McLean doesn't do, right? I think that's so important. So also working with found materials. I had such fun a couple of weeks ago. I visited Michelle Shackener's grade two class in Richmond 
and I took in my collection of wired toys made by children in Africa, which I've had since I was a little girl. We had a long discussion with the children about why in Africa children have to make their own toys, which got into consumerism and what more fun it is to, you know, to be producers of the culture, not consumers of the culture. Big idea, right? And the children were just absolutely fascinated by this. Um, and they all set down, settled down to make wire toys. Uh, really, you know, amazing. They never had wire before, and because um, you know, we talk about the image of the child, they could do it. And they did some beautiful work. I don't know if you see the little car that the one little fellow made. To me, that was like a little James Bond car. It could have been in a James <laughs> Bond movie. And this was his first exposure to wire. And then he wrapped it all up in gold thread to make it shimmer. It, and, and by the way, the hood could open and the trunk could open. And I was expecting sort of wings to come out the side. Mm -hmm. He was amazing. And Michelin told me that this little fellow has a great deal of trouble um, concentrating, mm -hmm. you know, in the class. He has a, a short attention span. Well, he started working on his car. As soon as I put my, my wire toys out, he connected to them. And he worked right to the end of the afternoon on that car, never left his working spot. Um, and then the one next to it is a, a little girl who made that. Uh, they, her mother is a jeweler, and when she came to pick up her child at the end of the afternoon, she said, oh, I've never let my child use wire before. But you just think of the tension that child must have, been, must have paid to the mother. I mean, some of those strategies that she used, the techniques mm -hmm. she used in, in making that were amazing. I mean, the twisting of the wire, the looping of the wire was just amazing. I mean, you could sell her little cat figures she made. They were so beautiful. Uh, one child had wandered off early in the presentation, and I just thought she wasn't interested. Um, Michelle has an area, you know, you talk about how you arrange your room. She has an area for group work, and we were working in that part of the classroom. And then she has the desks arranged in sort of islands, two or three desks in, in groups. And this child wandered off. And we packed up all our things, and we were walking out the door. And I just happened to look down at this child's desk. And you know what she had made? She'd signed her name with wire and embellished it all with beads. It was absolutely beautiful. And I just wished I had a photograph of it, but we were scooting out the door, right? But you know, that's a child who just wandered off and, is, and think was not interested, but it's done this absolutely beautiful work. So working with found materials, I think, is a really, working with those kind of materials is really important for children. And now we get for making opportunities for families to participate. So I think it's really important, you know, like I went into that school, I'd done it in my many, I'd taken my wire into all my children's classrooms. I think it's really important to invite families to con contribute their ideas. And as Kathy said, many of the immigrant families have special uh, skills that they can share, like my African toys, right? Mm -hmm. I have this wonderful collection to share with people. And then ask for help for families who have special skills related to the project. Um, set out written messages on cards in conjunction with activities in the classroom to invite family participation. These strategies are especially useful for strong start teachers. And the last point I got from Kate Dawson's strong start class, she's in the audience today. She'd used the strategy to invite parents to help their child trace a spider as part of a small project on spiders. Note the simple but effective documentation panel. So do you think of documentation as being very complex, but it also can be very effective, and perhaps even more effective if it's quite simple. But to walk into that classroom and see that documentation gave us just a sense of what was happening in the room and how important that was for a visitor. Um, supporting the group. Encourage the group of children to take ownership of the project within the envelope of safety established by the teacher. This was difficult with a wire, you know, when I went into that classroom to, get, to give the children permission to take ownership of working with that wire. I wanted to have all sorts of <laughs> um, safety factors. But, but because I believe children are competent, right, I let them mm -hmm. within the safe. Uh, we had a few safety rules, but it worked. For instance, a teacher to encourage a group of children to take ownership of a project might, might ask questions like, what do you think we could do, as opposed to asking a question that has one right answer. So hand it over to the, to the children to think, what could we do in this situation? And we did that with the wire. We said, how can we be safe using this wire? And the children had some good ideas. You know, we, we didn't sit too closely next to each other, and we kept the wires to ourselves. They came up with some very good ideas. Allow the children to establish their own code of behavior within acceptable limits set by the teacher. 
I have found that you know if the Reggio Emilia environment's working, it's not a problem. Behavior's not a problem. Um, at first, teachers may, if, if there is a difficulty with a group, at first teachers may participate as a group member and encourage children to share ideas with each other as opposed to teacher to child. The ideas go child to child. And then slowly the teacher can withdraw as children begin to pose questions and pr become protagonists of their own learning. So it takes time to get a group to function well, um, but it's, it's very rewarding. And the teacher uh, develops these skills as she works along with it. Supporting the projects. Pra projects do not always run smoothly. Sometimes they end for no reason and you're left with all these materials. And you know, what do you do about it? I think, you know, the teachers learn to have different provocations, to allow side ideas to come up. And we'll talk about this more in the, in the project, The Castle and Night, which, where it happened. Um, the teacher needs to accept that there are lulls and bursts of activity as part of the progression of the project. So don't despair if there's a lull, because it might generate again. At times, however, the teacher will need to use creativity to think of ways to keep the children interested in the project. So in the Castle and Night project, we thought maybe dragons might be a good way to go, but you'll see what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes a provocation like a visitor, a field trip, or introducing some different and appealing material like wire, as we did in the with making the crowns, will rekindle the interest, the children's interest. I, I'm a great one believing in materials as moving a pro project along. Children love to use materials, you know, and mm -hmm. when in the in the bridge project, when the um, engineer brought in all those lovely materials to build bridges, the whole thing just exploded again. Then it's important, I think, for everybody's satisfaction to bring the project to a close in a, in a satisfactory way. There's some signs that tell us when a project is near closure. For instance, when a major task of the project is complete, you know, there's a sign, we did it, we built the castle now. And children do not come up with any new ideas related to the project to explore further. Didn't happen in the Castle and Night project that way. And when the children no longer seek books on the topic, you know, you bring in all your books. I used to bring them in every Saturday. <laughs> from the, I mean, I collected them every Saturday, brought them in on Monday, and the books stay on the shelf, right? Nobody takes them out. They're into something else now. And the artwork no longer reflects the ideas of what the children are working on on the topic. <coughs> And then the, I think the, from the documentation is perhaps the, most, the biggest indication. You can tell from the documentation that it's time to end a project, as there's a sense of the beginning, the middle, and the end. It's like a complete package, right? And then you know it's time to move on. So with practice, I think teachers get, uh, get a feel for when the topic ends. Um, I think we've covered the next one, to test assumptions when a top part Mm -hmm. You can try a provocation and so mm -hmm. forth. But one of the great ways to bring a project to an end is to plan a celebration. And in the next set of slides, you will see how a Chinese dragon was invited to attend a picnic to celebrate the end of the Castle at Night project. Okay, this is the Castle at Night project. This is the one, the project that I've worked with them for the longest. It lasted for six months at the Marpole Oak Ridge Preschool with four-year-old children. Early in the school year, the teachers at Marple Oak Ridge decided that they would encourage the children, many of whom, as I told you before, did not speak English as, an, uh, as a first language, to engage in an in-depth exploration of authentic art materials like clay and paint. And I was all for this, you know, because this is my, my interest. The children, however, had a totally different idea. And with the teachers and me as a participant and observer, we never could figure out how a whole class of preschool children decided they were going to build a, a castle in their classroom right from the beginning of the school year. <laughs> and if anybody can help me answer that question, I would be really happy. I wrote about it in my book. Um, but they chose this topic. Right from the beginning of the year, the children's play was all about dressing up as princesses or play fighting with swords, which the children would come in. First thing they did, make themselves a sword out of interlocking blocks, and we'd have fights. When the teachers put out clay to begin an in-depth exploration of this art medium, what happened? The children immediately made castles. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. And they're sophisticated castles. The found materials that we had in the room on the, on the shelves were used to build castles. And even the parents started sending in 
castles they had made with the children at home. So all these little castles were arriving and we had them on all the shelves. I think we must have had 15 little castles sent in by the families. Everybody was saying, do something about this. They, um, the teacher decided something had to be done with all this enthusiasm for castles. So they had a brilliant idea. They invited the actors in from the Society for Creative Anachronism. Do you know that society? Mm -hmm. They're amazing. And they came dressed in their medieval clothes and brought all the artifacts, you know, from a medieval castle. And the teachers were just uh, um, astonished at the absolute rapt attention of the children. They just sat there literally with their mouths open looking at these. They took in everything, amazing information. Well, when I arrived at the next door, uh, next day I tried to go as often as I could. Guess what? All the little fellows were lined up with their swords and they did a courtly bow for me. <laughs> and this is, they, had they l learned quite a new way of using swords. We never had sword fighting again. We now had courtly, knightly behavior. So this is maybe to show you, you know, how behavior changes when you change the, the, um, the scene. So the teachers felt, well, they had really not wanted to build a castle, but now they just had to build a castle. So they started, they asked the, the parents to send in materials, and they just talked with the children what the about what the medieval actors, what they learned from the medieval actors, and what a castle needed. So note the wide variety of materials that children use to create their castles. Aren't they amazing? Oh, isn't it amazing? Um, the children themselves made a moat which they designed, and the moat had to have alligators in it, which <laughs> they insisted upon. They made the most beautiful clay horses for the stables. They were absolutely beautiful. They made a vegetable and a flower garden and a garderobe, if you know what a garderobe is, which emptied into the moat. Children were very interested in where people went to the toilet in the castle, and this was many conversations about that. <laughs> Every single room in the castle was furnished by the children. They worked hard on the castle the furniture. They made beds, they made thrones, they made dining tables, and as I said, the castle even had a drawbridge that lifted up and down. So they multiple ways to explore the project. This is when I took my wire in and the children made beads on a wire frame. They, in, they invented their own individual crests and painted them on shields displayed on my right. They sewed tapestries, absolutely exquisite tapestries, to hang in the, on the castle wards. They were just amazing, just like the actors had shown them. The children then made a display of all the people who lived in a castle, the princesses, the king, and, and so forth. And amongst these was a knight, one of the little boys, Josh and Joe, who'd all along been rather on the fringes of the, of the project. In fact, he didn't speak English as a first language at all. And when, when he came to school, he was learning it fast, though. He made the knight, and then he told us, or he demonstrated, that he wanted to build a knight taller than his dad for Father's Day. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't that amazing? That came from perhaps the quietest child in the room. So thus began the second part of the project, building Josh and Joe's night. J Josh and Joe, who had instigated the idea, became the leader in building this larger than si knife sa a life size, size night out of recycled materials. It was actually one of the most amazing things. Then um, he'd built it for Father's Night. So you can see this project had started way before um, the break at Christmas and was now getting mm -hmm. to Father's Day. Um, so the teachers talked to the children and they said, Josh and Joe wants this night to be a surprise for Father's Day. So it would be a good idea if none of us told our fam anybody about it. This is a secret. So of course, being a secret, everybody <laughs> was motivated to work really hard. So they built the night. And then when the fathers came for Father's Night, the room was in darkness. And suddenly they turned on the lights and this huge, enormous night, night that the children had built themselves came out while well, there was a huge gasp of, oh, and the, the fathers were just thrilled, especially little Josh and Joe's family, because it was his idea, right? Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the project, the children recorded their experiences on paper, and the sheets were compiled into a book that told the story of the project from beginning to end. And then it was Xeroxed, and the books, each family received a copy because they had been so interested in it. So the night was finished, the castle was finished, and they, the teachers decided to have a celebration of a picnic in the park. And they asked the Chinese parents if they would like to bring a dragon to the park. The reason they did this is they felt that the children's interest was still really 
high and working on it and they and they they were also very concerned that much of the work had been very uh, stereo agenda stereotypes you know the girls had worked on the tapestries and the boys mm -hmm. had worked building and we were really concerned about that but somehow or other the children owned this project and it was very difficult to shift mm -hmm. uh, tasks but we mm -hmm. were concerned we thought the the castle would be more gender neutral <laughs> So this was our plan, right? <laughs> but not the children's. The dragon arrived at the at the picnic and it was amazing. He came out of the bushes and they screamed and they danced with the dragon. It was just amazing, really amazing um, in introduction of cultural values into the class, into the group. But when we went back to school, not a single word about the dragon, not a bit of interest in it. So that was the end of our idea. So we knew, <laughs> <laughs> we knew the topic is going to end with the with, with a picnic. Um, seasonal change. This was summer now, and seasonal change, in my experience, often brings about a change of interests mm -hmm. and projects that have been carried on with great enthusiasm suddenly, you know, die, and the children sense a need for change, of pace, and make many out more outdoor activities. So. Time to take another break. I talk too much. <laughs> you definitely <laughs> don't. You know, as you were speaking, Sue, I thought uh, how very much the, the work we're doing now in personalized learning mm -hmm. really is reflected in your piece, the child, the teacher, and the family mm -hmm. together and making it so so individual and personalized for mm -hmm. the children. It just It's quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I have... Um, uh, Mia Kalpa, in the next uh, piece of material, we've got uh, questions for you for the reflection break. Don't look at the stuff in your package because we've just replicated the reflection break two instead of giving you break three. So if you look on the slides that are on your computer, you'll see the actual questions we'd like you to tackle. The middle question I'm going to start with first, and it's what learning do you see happening in these projects? What do you see happening in the things that Sue's been talking to you about? Second one, reflecting on the example projects, what ideas do you have to further expand the learning? There's some rich, rich, incredibly rich ideas there. And number three, how might you approach such a project with students who are older, grade three, et cetera, or, you know, even older? You know, mm -hmm. how might you explore the, the possibility? So keep your questions coming in to us. We're going to come back to you in about five minutes with some questions. We'll be back to Sue. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> Hi. We have a question that came in from uh, our audience in Victoria. And Sue's thinking that we paid them for this question, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. But it's exactly where she's going in the next piece. But we'll mm -hmm. just give a tease here. We'll, the question is, how can we reassure parents and other community members that project-based learning has the kind of rigor, bracket assessment, uh, standards, that they expect for their child? Well, for me, because I'm Radio Amelia inspired, it's through documentation and uh, careful documentation of the projects. I think when parents read the documentation, they understand the depth that we are doing, we, we are reaching with their children's learning. Um, document Documentation is an absolutely essential part of a project. It is a complex process, as can see, be seen from the following quotation. Documentation is not about the reorganization and arranging a material with the aim of assembling a descriptive linear story. Rather, documentation is a narrative pathway with arguments that seek to make sense of the events and processes. So it was from the documentation of the Castle and Knight project that we became concerned about the gender stereotyping. It was through the discussions of the documentation that we started to think, where should, how can we go in a different direction here? We were getting worried about it. Documentation is essential. It, it turns the teachers into researchers, right, and critical thinkers. Um, some, uh, it, we think of documentation as a big problem, but in actual fact it can be done in a very simple ways. In the um, Castle and Knight project, for instance, when the little uh, Al Alvin designed the, um, the drawbridge, we just sent a small um, email to all the parents with a, with a, with a, a, a what do you call it, a, a photograph of the, of, the, of the drawbridge that he designed to all the families and said, this is where we're going next with the castle project. So we kept them up to date with the mm -hmm. documentation. And when they saw the plan that that little fellow had designed, had used it, it was it could have been the plan of an engineer. He thought about um, springs for the bridge. He thought about levers and pulleys. 
absolutely amazing. Well, no parents would question the learning, what learning was going on, if they saw the, 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 the depth of thinking in that child's work. So it can be just simple. That was just a simple email to, to the, all the parents in the school. Um, so documentation provides for all of us a record of the learning experiences in the classroom. It provides children, parents, and teachers an opportunity to reflect, review, and plan future experiences. And documentation reveals connections between events, experiences, and learning goals and outcomes. It, with the, if the documentation is done very carefully, and we'll see this in the theories project that Catherine McCain does in Powell River, the documentation gives you ample information to complete the learning outcomes that are required. We are the Fairies Live Project. Here we return to Catherine McLean's kindergarten class to experience where the fairies live. We have, always read, we have already read some of the documentation, that beautiful piece of documentation she compiled. Note the extensive use of natural materials and how the children have used them not only to make fairies, but also the numbers and um, alphabet. So all this is documented for parents to see the depth of the learning that's growing. Catherine also did a unit on the enchanted forest. She used many farm materials in the classroom as can be seen from the trees made for the enchanted forest in the slide. Catherine told me that the children develop early literacy by using the materials to explore color, texture, size, shape, pattern, and sequencing, and classification, and to learn about numbers and the alphabet. She said all this provides her with information to complete each child's learning outcomes, as can be seen in the following slide. Um, as you, so you see, I've gone through the documentation fairly quickly because we have had examples of it all the way through, and I know we are running rather late, but I just did want to emphasize that it can be quite simple, but it can also be very complex. And you, if you think about the journal or the book, the portfolio that the children made at the end of the Cast of Night project, that was a record, a narrative record of the whole, pros, the whole project. But then the simple, looking at the um, drawbridge was just a simple use of documentation. But I think that it's absolutely essential. I think without documentation, it's very difficult to make project-based learning a satisfying experience. Mm -hmm. So as you read through the list of learning goals from ELF and for kindergarten grade one and three, which we are including, which we have listed in the, in the following slides, you will note that they were all covered in, in Catherine McLean's Fairy Project, mm -hmm. or, or sections of it were covered, I should say. So I'll just read them very quickly to build, create, and design using different materials and techniques, to be creative and expressive in a variety of ways, to express their own points of view and reflect on others' views, and understand how their actions affect nature and the planet. And then for kindergarten, to use imagination, observation, stories to create images, to experiment with a variety of materials, technologies, and processes to make images, and to, to build and describe 3G objects, and to describe the features of local plants and animals. And then the grade one and the grade three outcomes become ever more complex. But I think with a, you can see from the documentation and from the projects that, we've dis that we have um, discussed that there's plenty of material there to answer these, mm -hmm. these uh, learning mm -hmm. outcomes. Sharing descriptions with others add to and deepen the interpretation. So link your pedagogical narrations to the BC Early Learning Framework, evaluate plan, and start the process again. That is from the... Um, the, the, the diagram, right? Mm -hmm. And finally, I'd like to end by showing you an amazing project that the teachers and children carried out a year ago during the Olympics and Mar Polo Quidditch. You can sit back and just enjoy this and watch this. So the, the project began when one child, Evan, spontaneously built out of blocks an Inukshuk, a rock stru a structure used by the Inuit as a direction master, a marker that became the emblem for the Olympic Games. Uh, the, other, uh, uh, the other children became interested in Evan's enthusiasm, especially as at this time the Olympic flame, luckily for us, passed nearby the school and the children went out to see it, or the parents took the children to see it as it passed in the evening. Evan told the class that the Inukshuk is to make it look olympic -y. <laughs> <laughs> So all his work is paying off. Huh? The teachers brought in photos from the newspaper every day from this point on, and of course, most of the children were watching the events on TV. Enthusiasm was like a wind horse that swept the room. This is a Buddhist term that Carol Ann Wien in her book, 
refers to to raise a positive energy to the life force that whirls through us. Catherine Wien uses the term wind force to describe the atmosphere in a classroom when a project takes hold. I think it's a beautiful way of, um, of, of thinking about it. And it was much in evidence in this project. And the following photos tell the story for themselves. So children, because I think the teachers had done, set it up so well, they'd brought in the photographs, they brought in the newspaper articles, they discussed with the children what they were seeing on te television. So interest was really running high and representation was very, very, very beautiful. For instance, families uh, also sent in their own experience, their own personal experiences during the Olympics. And children added these venues to the map that they had decided to create in the, of the Olympics. Isn't that amazing that four-year-old children would think to do mm -hmm. something as abstract as a map? But they wanted a map to record all their experiences. Um, the children were very interested, of course, in the Olympics as a sporting event. So they, in their own play, were um, representing the sporting events they'd seen. So there was a great deal of speed skating, and the children mimicked the, f the postures of the speed skaters with the arm behind the back absolutely perfectly. <laughs> there was ice skating, and all these became their favorite pastimes. And the wonderful thing, these are all immigrant, many, many, many of these children are immigrants, and they wanted the Canadian flag on the goalposts. <laughs> and they wouldn't play their ice hockey game unless a Canadian flag was on the goalpost. Smart. Yeah. <laughs> it was amazing to see how carefully the children must have watched the figure skating to be able to recreate the postures and movements so accurately in the figure skaters' pictures that they made. They recreated these with paper strips and decorated them with sparkly materials. <laughs> They'd obviously be paid a lot of attention to the costumes because they demanded sparkly material for the costumes. <laughs> so. Um, in documenting the Olympic project, the teachers noted, and this is in their critical analysis, how powerful media is in influence children's behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much of what you've seen in these slides had come from the media, from the newspapers and from the TV. They, they noted how um, powerful a shared experience is in motivating children's learning and how these shared memories provoke complex collaborative group work. The children and teachers experience again and again the power of being caught up in the emotional experience, the windows effect. The whole, the whole project just swept the group away. It was to go in and, and sense the energy in that room was just so powerful. Um, the project demonstrated how important it is to have available, and for me this is critical, a wide variety of materials. You saw a number of materials that the children used in creating the map and all the other things for the Olympics. Um, and it's very important for children who do not speak a common language to have these materials to communicate with. I think I've said that earlier because it helps them cross language and cultural barriers in the group. The teachers noted how helpful it had been to introduce cues such as photographs and newspaper articles to support the children and families during the project. So these would be the provocations that move the project along. The powerful effect of collaboration between teachers, children and families, especially sharing their memories, was evident throughout the project. It was so exciting for the families to come in and say they'd gone on a zip line together. Mm -hmm. They'd taken a sky train out to Richmond where they li many of them live. Huh? So documentation captured the experience of the project as a whole and enabled the teachers to debrief and think together what had happened and why. So this is where the teachers become the researchers. And the project seems to demonstrate how strongly children strive to be part of the culture surrounding them, how closely they are observing what's going on in their neighborhoods, in their communities. And this seems to be especially important for children from immigrant families who are entering the Canadian culture for the first time. So I think we have to think about that, mm -hmm. to give children opportunities to feel part of the culture. And I think a project like this is a wonderful example of how it helped them feel part of the culture. We need the Olympics every year here, <laughs> all the money. Huh? So the child has a hundred languages and a hundred hundred more and they steal 99. No way the hundred is there, says L Loris Malaguzzi. So I would like to thank all the teachers and children whose work has been part of this presentation. So we've come to the end of my presentation, but these are the key concepts I'd like you to take away with you. I hope that you feel that project-based learning is a powerful learning tool. 
for me, it's just the, the way to go, right, with children, the way to work with children. It engages learners based on personalized interests. You've seen how that's happened, especially with the Olympic project. Project-based learning enables every learner to feel they are contributing members of the class. It supports children in developing lifelong learning skills such as collaboration, inquiry, and problem solving. I feel it really puts children in touch with their center of the universe, you know, with their, it grounds them in the community in which they live. Co projects can be co-created, investigated by both small and large groups. You don't have to feel the whole group has to be part of a project. A small group can continue on with it. And as you've seen, projects can be brief. They can extend for a day, a week. My WIRE project was a day project. Uh, it can go for weeks or months or even decades, as it did in Reggio Emilia. Isn't that amazing? Just depending on the children's and students' interest. And project-based learning is a method for teaching students of all ages using an interdisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. For me, it's worked in preschool, it's worked in kindergarten, it's worked in the primary school, and it's worked with the students in, in the college system. So it's gone right from the earliest to the, to the older. We've done, we've done wonderful projects with the college students as well. So I just, uh, I think you've, you can, un, as you see how passionate I am about it, mm -hmm. I really believe it's a wonderful, wonderful way to work with children in classrooms. So thank you, Kathy. Oh. For, for supporting me through all this. <laughs> it is my pleasure. Do you uh, have the energy to do a few of these questions? There's some yes, cool I do. questions yes, that have I been do. coming. I'm very happy to do. I love answering questions. There are. How about this one? This is from Brandy. From Brandy, and Brandy says, School District 83. Mm, have to think about that. I'm not sure I know right off where Brandy is, but thanks, Brandy. When you have a diverse group of ages and interests. How do you choose the one to focus on? Is that the age to focus on? Or? I think so, the age. Wh why don't we start with the ages? Okay, well, the age to focus yeah. on, yeah. yeah. Well, I, um, I, I like multi-age groups because you have a, a many different um, ability levels, right, mm -hmm. to share, the, to help and help each other. And children like to help each other. You know, if you give them the opportunity, they, they're very, um, very collaborative. And if you've collaborative, co collaboration is one of your key principles, of course, they'll be collaborative. So I don't think you have to focus on any one age. I think all the and I think children are. I mean, I think in the, what we've seen in these projects, you mm -hmm. can't put children in developmental stages in boxes anymore because they've gone soaring way beyond their what we've thought as a, a typical developmental uh, ability. So some of the younger children sometimes just have surprised us, like Josh and Joe with his building of the night. He was probably the youngest child in the class, and he was became the leader. So I don't think you have to worry about that. In fact, I think multi-age groups are probably quite an advantage. I would love to have done the window project in Italy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, should we go and do it? Yes, <laughs> I'm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. This is from Vivian from Vancouver. So Vivian's wondering how she can develop the theme of superheroes into a project in her kindergarten classroom. Yeah. Every person's a superhero. Yes, yes. I think it's a challenge, but when we were in Reggio Emilia, they were doing uh, a project on Disney characters. And they said you have, to re you have to respond to the children's interests, right? Mm -hmm. And to the kind of community they come from. And if they're in interested in Disney characters, then let's explore Disney ca characters. So I think with sup superheroes, I think you look for the positive things, the positive behaviors that superheroes have. Mm -hmm. Heroes of wonderful qualities, right? Mm -hmm. Let's focus on that. And I actually have, I haven't been part of a project, but I have heard of a number of schools, of course, who have done superheroes because it's a driving, passionate interest of the children. I just, I think these projects make ch teachers creative, right? Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no boredom. <laughs> they <laughs> challenge us to think very, very, very deeply about things and our values, right? But from Reggio Emilia and the Disney characters we saw them exploring, they do it, <laughs> you know, because part of the children's culture. We just have to think of ways of doing it that match our values. So that's not a very satisfactory answer, but <laughs> oh, I, 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 but I it think it's where we have to yeah, go with it. Absolutely. Yeah. There are many little superheroes in my life and they would yeah. really like that yeah. answer. Yeah. Hi, my name is Barb and I'm from Maple Ridge. I'm curious about how to manage more than one project at a time. Oh my goodness. Yes, I think you have to um, choose. I, I mean, I think that's very, very hard to manage more than one at a time. Uh, and I think it's a question of sitting with a group and talking, uh, talking about it and figuring out where you want to go with it. 
to see if there's a way of blending them. You know, I'm very flexible about things like that. Mm -hmm. In Reggio Emilia, they will have just the regular program in the, cl in the classroom, but they will take the children who are working on a project into the atelier to work on it so that they can have an undisturbed time and the materials there that they need. If we had space like that, maybe you could manage more than one project at a time, but I would find it hard. Mm -hmm. I would want to focus on one project and do it well. Mm -hmm. But some people might be able to, mm -hmm. you know, their minds might work in that way. Yeah, different personalities. Yeah, but I find, you know, it's like work. it's a wind horse effect. The children mm -hmm. get caught up in the one idea and they run mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. So usually one of the projects falls by the wayside yes. and uh, the other project takes off. Mm -hmm. Now this one's an interesting one, I think, because it gives us a bit of a strong start um, emphasis here. Hi, my name's Kate and I'm from Richmond. My question is how do other how to offer project learning opportunities with a highly variable drop-in clientele? I I think um, I think we've learned from Kate Dawson this that you can do it. You know, you can do it by doing simple things like I loved your investigation of spiders and involve the I think um, with the strong star teachers you have this wonderful resource of parents and grandparents. And I think you can really put them to work if you find strategies for putting them to work. And I love the way you did it with cards. I went to see a wonderful Strong Start program in North Vancouver where the, where the uh, facilitator had read the little mitten book, you know, to the, to the children and they were very interested in the little mitten book. So the facilitator got the parents to make mittens for the children. Mm. And, uh, and then the children made the little animals that went into the mittens. So it became really involving the parents. And then they all, um, a lot of songs about mittens and stories about mittens. So mittens became a great uh, project mm -hmm. involving the parents because they had made the mittens. They embellished the mittens with beads. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful thing to watch. I was thrilled to see it. Oh, so it, I think parents can bring huge yes. richness to a program. Yes. It, I came away so excited from that program <laughs> and, and Kate with the spider. I think to see parents involved is one of the things that's very rewarding. I think we're coming to a close <laughs> here. Are you, Take off my glasses. I know. <laughs> have a drink of water and replenish your, yourself. Thank you so much, Sue. Oh, it was absolutely a remarkable time to spend here with you this afternoon. Your passion and your <laughs> determination to actually see this through and and to see, you know, the love of children grow is just quite amazing. Well, I can't believe how much I've enjoyed this. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't feel so at the beginning, I'm sure. Yeah, I just sure. love being here with all of you and Aww. felt the energy in the room and, and from out in the province. What a thrill it's been for me. Aww, and I just want, you know, to be able to share these teachers' work with you. Absolutely. It should be sh it shared should be because shared. it's so very special. Absolutely. So this material uh, and this uh, webcast will be archived and it'll be on the Ministry of Education website. It'll be coming up in the spring and the spring will be coming up too, I hope, because it's not very nice weather out there right now. <laughs> but it'll be available on the, on the Ministry of Education website. And again, Sue, it's just been a pleasure being with you here today. It's been today. a pleasure to be with you all. Right. <laughs> I loved it. Thank you. I'd like to also take just a minute here to thank our behind the scenes team. We have our early learning branch people from the Ministry of Education, my colleague Paige McFarland, my colleagues Carolyn Henson, Melanie Bradford, and the person who coordinated this for us today was Sue um, Angie uh, Kallenberg. Thank you so much for coming and being part of this and coordinating this and bringing it to the province. Our camera team today is New Lion and of course our resident expert, Audrey Hobbs Johnson. What could we do without them? So thank you for everybody for making this possible. And Sue, mm -hmm. maybe we'll be doing more of this. Thank you so much and mm -hmm. goodbye.